Robert Jaron, Senior Director of Government Affairs, that's me. A um, couple of disclaimers, I will use the word old and I, will use, it, I use, will use the word senior and I don't mean anything disparaging by that, so my apologies. I'm not an aging ex expert, um, however I do work in the area of mobile health. Um, we like to call it wireless health and life sciences. I'm based here in Washington, D.C. Um, a little bit about Qualcomm, we're a huge company and we're actually the world's largest fabless semiconductor producer. Um, fabless, number one in wireless in the world. Um, so prior to right now, how many people had heard of Qualcomm? So quite a bit, okay, that's great. About 10 years ago when I'd say that, I'd get you know, maybe one lonely guy in the back of the room that would raise his hand. Um, so what that means, we'll get into in a couple of seconds. So just to give you some context, um, wireless, or rather mobile uh, cellular communications um, are really the largest platform in the history of mankind. 6.3 billion wireless connections worldwide that are cellular connections currently. Okay, there are 7 billion people in the world. Um, 3G is uh, just the, uh, one of the four evolutions. Uh, you may hear the terms 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G. How many people know what 3G is? Have you heard the term 3G? Yeah. Okay, everyone's heard it, right? And some people are now hearing the term 4G. Um, that's just the evolutions of the interfaces. Th these are the technologies that drive mobile communications, meaning how quickly you can upload or download data and what kinds of things you can do with your data. Um, so 3G is really now becoming quite old. 4G is the next flavor that really has begun to take off. You'll be hearing a lot more about 4G in the coming years from AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, et cetera. So smartphones have our chipsets in there. When I say that we are the world's largest producer of uh, wireless uh, chipsets, um, those are the ones that power your devices that most of you are carrying. Um, in, in the uh, history of the company, we've produced over 8 billion chipsets. So they power things like, like smartphones. We're expecting that by 2016, there'll be about 5 billion cumulative smartphone units that are out in the world. Um, so, you know, again, context, 6.3 billion people right now have wireless, com uh, wireless subscription. 5 billion within 2016 will have a smartphone, which means that there'll be a lot more. Um, the thing about smartphones and the thing about what Qualcomm does is that we try to squeeze as much as we can into one of these wireless semiconductors because it acts like a modem and a processor. Okay, um, and we also make some just single modems. For example, if you have an iPad 3G, you have our, our chip in it that's just a, pro a, a modem. It's not a processor. So it's only giving you the interface so it can communicate um, ubiquitously. So um, what we're trying to do with smartphones via our chipsets and via the technology is make them graphic rich, um, content aware, um, actually tell you where you are, location based services. That's all driven by the chipsets that are in your phones. And with that, you get things like augmented reality um, and applications that use augmented reality. For example, there's an app on the market called, uh, I, I believe it's made by a company called Looktel. They may have a, another corporate name for the app. Um, but what you do is you use your phone, you take a picture of um, a, a piece of currency, whether it be a coin or, or a bill, and it reads it out for you. So it's used by the visually impaired so that they know, um, you know what they're actually using as denominations. Um, you know, and the other aspect of mobility is that it, it interconnects and interoperates with other forms of communication. So when I talk about a smartphone, when I talk about mobility, um, chipsets, our chipsets go into a smartphone and they, no, they no, not only speak with the local radio network which is um, governed by someone who owns the spectrum. Okay, so for example, Verizon, um, Sprint, T-Mobile, they own network communication spectrum and they operate their networks. Um, but there are other radio interfaces that actually reach into the home and that people use. For example, if you have a car and you're familiar with Bluetooth, that's a different radio. And that doesn't give you ubiquitous coverage. It gives you coverage within feet. Um, Wi-Fi will give you coverage within feet or meters, you know, probably 300. But it doesn't give you uh, coverage beyond that. Something has to connect to those sensors and those devices to give you the ubiquitous coverage. So for example, in the U.S., we have 98% um, saturation in coverage by at least one mobile broadband um, provider. Um, there, the 2% means that there is really literally no coverage, and that's in obviously areas of low population density. Um, however, that ubiquitous coverage would happen through um, a device like a smartphone that has a mobile broadband connectivity to a network. If you don't have that connectivity, then you can't really connect out to the cloud and to other services. So that's something to keep in mind when innovators are making their products, because you can definitely make a product that has a low-range radio, but unless it connects to something else or it's wired into cable, 
it's not going to be able to speak to anything else. It's kind of insular. It's just there. So um, other, uh, other non-handset devices, when you think about um, other cell phones, most people won't think of a Kindle. A Kindle is actually a cell phone. It's just not in the form factor of a, of a cell phone. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the company that's making the Kindle devices uses a uh, ubiquitous mobile broadband chipset, which uh, in this country speaks on the Sprint network. So it's actually a Sprint phone. Um, so most people don't know that, but that's what gives you that constant ubiquitous coverage. You can take your Kindle from New York to LA and it's going to work wirelessly, seamlessly, without you knowing what's going on in the background. And all that information, all that data is being filtered through a network operations center somewhere most likely Qualcomm's, which is doing all the billing function and making sure that you're getting exactly the book that you're trying to upload or, or whatever. Um, other non-smartphones um, are things like um, iPads, as I mentioned, tablet PCs, even um, 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 uh, laptops. Uh, my laptop is made by Lenovo. It has a Intel chip in it. Intel and Qualcomm uh, notoriously don't get along. Um, because you know they think we're trying to steal their, their market share and, and we think they're trying to steal ours, but, but I actually get along quite well with Intel. It was interesting because I was at a um, meeting on the Hill a couple of years ago and um, we were showing a laptop made by Panasonic. It's actually a healthcare laptop, one of their tough books that you can throw against the ground um, and it's made for clinical care. Um, and it was funny because I, I mentioned we were with Senator Wyden um, of Oregon and I mentioned you know this um, laptop also has ubiquitous connectivity and the Intel representative looked at me and said what are you talking about it does not you know there's no Qualcomm chip in there and I said there is there's a Gobi chip in there so we, we interoperate and we live cohabitate with lots of things and lots of devices and lots of radios um, so trends here we get into the trends on average a person looks at their phone once every six and a half minutes or 150 times a day <laughs> That's a lot, right? That's a lot. What are the things that everybody carries with them? You in the green. What do you carry with you every day? Well, your cell phone. Thank you. That's one. What's two and three? Keys. Keys. Very good. And what's the last one? Wallet. 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 Exactly. Now, of those three, which ones do you think are going to disappear and which one do you think you're going to actually have going forward? Wallet and keys go away, right? You can now pay for your parking meter via your phone. Um, pretty soon there'll be near field communications and you can just tap your phone to something and it's going to pay. Um, keys are beginning to disappear. We have smart, smart homes and smart grid um, which are now beginning to make everything kind of interoperating and, and make everything smart around them. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about in a second. But, um, you know, your, your phone, you carry your phone. It's not just a communications device, it's a computing device. And again, it, it, it can augment reality. There are apps right now in the market that you can um, enable your GPS function, lift up your phone, and with your camera, um, take a video shot, and automatically it will tell you what's going on in that area. So for example, it will know, because you carry it with you all the time, that you like to go to Starbucks. And it will know that your favorite shoe store happens to be Nine West. Um, and it will know that your PT is down the street. And it will also know that you're friends with, you know, John Doe and, you know, Jane X. So when you do that, it will tell you, hey, John Doe happens to be down the street at Starbucks. And if you walk in there right now and mention code such and such, you're going to get a 10% discount. It knows you. And the same thing can be applied at home. So that's really where I'm going with this whole thing. Now, um, seniors. Um, encompass a big, big part of the population. And a World Health Organization statistic that I really like to use is that within the next five years, the number of adults age 65 and over will outnumber children under the age of five. By 2050, they will outnumber children under 14. Okay, so that's a big number. And that's a big opportunity. Okay, we're all aging. I actually feel like I'm in the, in the winter of life. Um, I'm definitely not the, uh, the first three. Um, and the other issue is that a lot of people are sick. Um, a lot of people are overweight. Um, a lot of people have chronic diseases. In the U.S. alone, one out of every, almost every two adults um, uh, has a chronic disease. That's, that's a lot, at least one chronic disease, um, you know, quite a bit. So where I'm going with this is that as we age and as technology improves and as radios become cheaper, faster, and even more ubiquitous than we have, you know, for example, right now in the U.S., we have 331, billion, uh, 331 million um, subscribers of, of mobile devices, um, yet we only have 313 million people. So we are now at 104% penetration. So that means everyone's carrying a phone or something that's connected. 
um, Ericsson Wireless, which is a company that I used to work for, um, actually has this wonderful three waves of connected devices development. Um, we're really in the phase of networked industries and we're going into that third wave, but they claim that by 2020 there will be 50 billion connected devices. So that'll be things in your house, um, sensors in your house, sensors on you, um, in your car, around you, etc. Um, that way you don't know that you're being monitored, you're being watched in a sense. Um, obviously there are privacy and security aspects, we're not going to get into that right now, but um, I just want to make sure that people understand that all of these things will add to the profile of who you are, what you do, and build trends, build an understanding, a very deep and personal understanding of who you are, what you are, and what your needs are. And that fits perfectly in healthcare. Emerging regions. I'm bringing this up because I, I just mentioned how many people in the U.S. have a connected device. In the world, 13% of, of, of emerging regions have a PC installed base. 5%, and I actually thought it was less than 5%, have fixed internet penetration, but 78% have mobile penetration. So a way of reaching the public is going to really be via their phone. And you can see that happening all over the world in, in places like Africa, Asia, uh, in, in particular in Latin America. I, I used to work in Latin America, and I can tell you that uh, the one thing folks have down there is their, is their phone. And a lot of those phones are dumb phones, they're not smartphones. So they're going to be going into the era of smartphones. Opportunity, opportunity for innovators. Connectivity. So the Internet of Everything is one of the terms that Qualcomm likes to use um, because all of these devices have some kind of wireless, um, wireless connectivity. And if they don't have wide area network connectivity, what I was mentioning before, mobile broadband, then they have a short range radio which then can connect to something that does have that coverage, that can give it that, um, that connection to the cloud, to information, to data. That's what makes them smart. So everything from a smart reader down on the left to um, the body media fitness uh, device, which is actually a, a class two medical device, a lot of people don't know that, um, to printers, to TVs, to uh, appliances. They are all beginning to um, become connected because it's really cheap to put a chip in there. And then suddenly you, have, you don't have this insular device that can just break down out of nowhere and you didn't know it was happening. You have a device that's now smart and it can warn you and tell you something is wrong with me. One of my belts is not working and I'm going to break. And I'm going to call the technician for you and they're going to contact you so that th they can come in and fix me. You know, um, when it comes to something like healthcare, it would hopefully be a sensor or a patch or some kind of a biometric um, a, a read or physiological read that can tell you, you know, your blood pressure normally you know, trends in a certain range. But for some reason, the last two or three days, it's been going off the charts. Something is wrong. You need to know about that. You know, your temperature, same thing. You know, you're, you're exuding some kind of strange secretion. Same thing. So this is what, you know, a, wired, a wireless or wired smart home will look like. All these small little cells. Whether they're wired or they're wireless, but they're mostly going to be speaking with each other. And that's what I'm really trying to impart on everybody here. This, this is the home of the future. And it can even be something like a mug that has a little sensor underneath it. And it's supposed to be used by the senior that's living in that home. And when that person isn't drinking as much as they normally are because they know that thing knows that you know, it's not being you know, lifted up, um, it can then warn that person or send a warning for that person to a care provider, a loved one, a friend, et cetera, et cetera. For example, there's a company called Vitality. They make these things called glow caps. Um, they're sold on Amazon. It, it works wirelessly. It's got an AT&T chip in it. The idea behind the glow cap is that it reminds a person for medication adherence purposes when they should take their medic medication. So it, it glows, just kind of glows off and on. If the person doesn't open it or doesn't lift it up, it then will vibrate. If that doesn't happen, I think it sends off an audible alarm. If that doesn't happen, it will send the person a text or call them. And if that doesn't happen, then it will call a loved one or a doctor or whoever you put down as the next person. Um, so aging independently, um, basic life monitoring, we were seeing things like bed pressure monitors, bathroom sensors, gas water sensors, emergency sensors, PERS devices, personal emergency response system sensors, you know, the old uh, Mrs. Fletcher, I've fallen and I can't get up. That's now being made wirelessly. There's actually a Qualcomm subsidiary that's working on them called Lifecom. Um, Philips works on a number of, of PERS devices. Benefits, obviously, involving your family, allowing remote analysis, et cetera. Um, 
the idea being that you can really live independently. Um, a lot of the devices that I've got listed on the left, which are the, your traditional medical devices, um, pulse oximeter, blood pressure cuff monitors, pedometers, um, home automation and control, fitness equipment, medication tracking or medication adherence devices, a lot of them are now being made smartly, and when I say smartly in the sense that they have a wireless chip in them and that they can communicate to some larger thing, whether it be a personal health record, um, hopefully in the future an electronic health record, and I roll my eyes because I'll get to that in two seconds. Um, but the idea that these smart homes will have the ability to communicate out, whether through wired purposes or wirelessly. And some of them actually uh, on their own, uh, glucometers for example is a company called Telcare um, based here in Bethesda that makes a wireless glucometer but it's wide area network uh, capability. I think it uses either a T-Mobile or an AT&T chip. So government affairs, the reason I bring this up is because all of the wonderful things that I've been talking about are regulated somehow or the government has policies written about them, and, um, or the, there are pending legislative things that are going to really impact the way that these things are either bought, sold, or, or manufactured. Um, Congress, uh, there have been a number of things that have come up in the recent past. The biggest one that I really want to bring up is ARA, the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, the stimulus package um, really earmarked $19.2 billion to incentivize um, the meaningful use of health information technologies. Um, the Office of the National Coordinator is really um, defining what that means and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in addition to the $550 billion that they allot every year for Medicare um, is using some of that $19.2 billion to incentivize doctors and eligible hospitals um, to be able to um, adopt these um, wonderful health information technologies which are actually only electronic health records. So that's a problem, and it's also an opportunity. Um, as meaningful use, stage one, stage two are adopted and being rolled out, and they're working on stage three, um, you'll see that engaging patients and families isn't really what we think of by engaging patients and families. They're, they're concentrating mostly on the aspects of electronic health records and the systems that govern electronic health records, and they're looking at how they certify these things and how they, they get used by docs. Um, missing from that are the applications, the sensors, the devices that are touching everybody. And, you know, that's something that uh, the industry is trying to work on. Food and Drug Administration. Um, actually, I'll go back to CMS. CMS is traditionally very, very bad at reimbursement for telehealth. I'm talking straight telehealth. You can roll in telehealth and a bunch of other services and get it paid for one way or the other and be creative. But straight telehealth, according to the American Tele Telemedicine Association, um, last year I think was about four million dollars with an M that was reimbursed for telehealth. Okay, now they have a budget for Medicare of 550 billion. Okay, plus another 300 billion for Medicaid. So it gives you an idea of, of, of the challenge there. Why? Fraud and abuse. I get that. I get the fraud and abuse, but there's a lot built into that regulation that really has not changed with the times. Part of it is that they won't accept store and forward technologies. Most of the stuff that I'm showing you can either be real-time or store and forward, so it's already discounted right off the bat. It has to happen from a specific site of care. It has to happen from a medical shortage area, which is about 16% of the country. Um, it has to be done by a specific care provider, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you see the challenge with reimbursement. And a lot of hospitals and doctors are really resistant in adopting health information technologies, but specifically things like remote patient monitoring and mHealth because they're not being reimbursed for it, so it comes out of pocket. So if they can use something that's, you know, an $8,000 device, which does one very singular thing, and I'm using the, uh, the example of a couple of years ago in the New York Times, um, there was an article about this woman that has ALS, and her son had uh, um, Down syndrome, and the child needed a specific durable medical piece of equipment that was a dumbed-down laptop that had been stripped of its, or masked of its operating system. And it was a reimbursable uh, medical device um, at, I believe, $8,000, and any uh, Apple or Droid store um, app that did the same thing, um, I think the Cadillac one was about $200 or $300, and of course the device that it would operate on, the smartphone, is probably about $400. So do you see the problem there? You know, they'll pay eight grand for something like that laptop, but not the, you know, $600, $700 for the smartphone. Two minutes, I'm almost done. Okay. FDA, um, the Food and Drug Administration is grappling with how to deal with converged medical devices. These are devices that are wireless and medical. 
Um, they have been very proactively involved in the space. They've issued a number of different guidance documents on radio frequencies, most notably the mobile medical guidance, um, mobile medical applications guidance document. There's a lot going on at the agency. The Office of the National Coordinator, I already mentioned um, via Health IT. The FCC did convene an M Health Task Force last summer. Um, I was lucky enough to be uh, named to be one of the leads. We developed um, findings and recommendations for the FCC, and there are a number of uh, recommendations that um, deal with some of the issues that I've spoken about. So, you know, look to, uh, to some stuff that's going to be coming out of that. And I bring up the National Institutes of Health because they're really trying to look at this space, the space of mobile health, and trying to qualify it because they see that there's a lot of potential here and a lot that's happening. Yet, um, one of the issues within government is uh, you know, how do we reimburse it? How do we say that it really works? We don't know. We don't want to, you know, enact anything legislatively because it's going to cost a lot of money and we don't know that the cost savings are going to be there. So I think that the NIH has single-handedly taken this on as we're going to produce the evidence that these things actually work to try to change health care in America. You know, those, those are all opportunities, all of this for, you know, entrepreneurs. And that's that. Thanks. Sir. I worked last year for Vodafone on, on mobile health, and the report was trying to understand the barriers to mobile health adoption, because the joke in the industry was that the mobile health space has been, essentially there's more pilots than United Airlines HQ, a lot of people doing little ideas, but they never really scale. So connecting with what you're saying, which is a wonderful idea about your smart homes and seamless good-looking models with things working beautifully in the background compared to what Ryan was talking about earlier, which is essentially sort of the senior living industry 1.0. How do we kind of bridge that gap? And you, I think, are in a great position, Qualcomm, to do that. But what sort of couple of things would you really like to see to take some of these great little ideas and actually scale them into Ryan's world? Right. Um, I, I, one, one issue for me, dearly, is the issue of reimbursement. I think that if we can somehow get CMS to change some of its policies, um, you know, that you'll see more adoption. The, the, for me, I think that the answer is adoption. People start really buying into these systems and into these services, and you get um, entire architectural companies that make these types of uh, uh, homes, you know, wire them in a certain way and get them prepared for, for the future you'll see this take off. But you won't see that take off unless doctors and hospitals actually start using them. And you won't see that until electronic health records and electronic health record systems um, start allowing the ability for uploading patient data straight into the EHR. That's one of the things that we were hoping was going to come out as stage two in meaningful use, and it got stripped out. Um, most recently, for stage three, they were talking about allowing um, patients to upload uh, information from blood glucometers from um, blood pressure, cuff monitors, and weight scales, and that recently got stripped out as well. So that's a problem. It's a symbiotic problem um, because if, if doctors don't see them, you know, being able to uh, get incentivized to use these things, they're not going to adopt them. If they're not adopting them, patients aren't going to buy something that they then can't send that information to a doc. So are you optimistic about, for example, the wellness side, which is less dependent on the reimbursement? Mm -hmm. And there might be some more you know, consumer pay models. Have you seen anything, any signs that those models are emerging? Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to say I think so. And I, I don't really follow the wellness area as much as I probably should. But I, I do know that things like Fitbit have become wildly popular. The Nike Fit system is also incredibly popular. Those are things that are out of pocket that people pay for themselves. Um, so, and, and you see a lot of folks really trying to integrate those things with other, um, when I say folks, I'm talking about industry. Um, partners trying to integrate with each other. That interoperability, they're making it happen without necessarily, um, you know, getting embroiled in the whole debate of, you know, can these stuff work together? There's an entire alliance out there called the Continua Health Alliance that you see a lot of companies, I think two, over 200 companies that are working to do exactly that, make sure that their devices work with each other. Um, you know, kind of bringing down the, 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 the idea that these things can't really communicate. Um, so I, I do see consumers buying these things, but they have to have a benefit that the consumer really likes. You know, it has to have a certain kind of stickiness. Just on that point, I think for entrepreneurs the audience, there's a lot of people doing these early, these early stage companies like Fitbit for the healthy, young, active, professional with probably extra disposable income. And we're not seeing much in the way of 
other people looking at innovative solutions for the broader right. selection. Anyway, uh, right. please. Actually, what I'd like to do is just go, go a step further. Are you familiar with the oak ridge retirement community in Oregon, which is all, yes. all wireless, yes. fully monitored? Intel community. is a big participant, I believe, in Oak Ridge. Right. Now, that place has now been there for a decade. Mm -hmm. And none of that is based on reimbursement. It's right. all based on the selling point of monitoring, moving, moving the model from treatment to prevention. Right. Um, is this catching on anywhere else? Uh, how how yeah. promising is this as a model for uh, I, I think I think as you see ACOs roll out, which are really more focused on uh, um, the accountable care organizations uh, rolling out. As you know, I forget how many. There's a couple hundred now, I believe, uh, ACOs that that are that are beginning. Um, and you see the focus away from fee for service to actually prevention. I think that you're going to see more and more interest by companies themselves to be able to, okay, you know, how do we actually prevent our population from being sick as opposed to waiting until they are sick and then taking care of them? Um, you know, there are, there are, you know, I don't want to beat up on CMS too much. There are, there are cracks in the armor. For example, the 2013 proposed fee schedule, which came out last week, so it's not proposed any longer, it's the fee schedule. There are two CPT codes in there which talk about acute care transitional um, reimbursement. And part of that is that the doctor or, or doctors have to have um, an engagement uh, with a patient two days after they leave the care facility. And they can do that either by consult, by phone, or electronic communication. That's a huge mind shift, mind shift change for CMS, huge. However, I think most doctors are going to do the consult or call the person, you know, so it doesn't really give us this opportunity for remote, remote patient monitoring, because so I think a lot of people in the industry are like, oh my God, that's it, we finally got reimbursement. No, not really. It gives them the opportunity to use this type of stuff, but. If I can stretch the time to just take this, this concept one step further, the, the first presentation that yeah. we heard talked about um, senior housing for, for boomers and, and the economic model for it. Um, where, where is the potential um, for this kind of reimbursement, for prevention reimbursement, to sort of subsidize boomers being able to move into wireless monitored senior housing so, so that you can back the sociological yeah. desire to be in groups with their decline in ability to pay for yeah. something that, that has an otherwise increased cost? As far as housing is concerned, I've seen very little, if nothing at all, about housing and subsidizing that housing for these purposes you know, that this health information technology in, in the housing form. Now, I, I can't say that, that that's what that means, that there's nothing out there. I believe there are Beacon Community Grants and a bunch of other things that CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, is working on that may touch upon some of these aspects. But, you know. No, I mean, there's the, the, the gap you spoke to is sort of reality. Yeah. You know, and, and I think um, on the CMS side, ACOs, yeah. I can see it happening, but most most consumers, that's not the world they live no. in. Yeah. So you might actually see the insurance providers, right. they actually might be the more likely channel. Mm. Exactly. They're taking more of a you know, capitated model. Correct. And then uh, you know, care more, for example, they, they yeah. did some things to help push it down. Yeah, and I, I can tell you with certainty that uh, Kaiser Permanente, Aetna, for example, um, have definitely taken, uh, taken note of this area and are doing things in this area. Um, you know, I'm not a representative for either one, but, but I, I hear and I see things. So, um, yeah. But, but you know, I, I, if I can just uh, round out that thought, again, um, I think that there has to be a cultural shift in the way that these things are embraced. And you see some aspects of that in the ACA. You know, um, when the ACA came out, um, Section 2703 deals with Medicaid health homes and rolling them out nationally. And there's, I think, a 90% match to the money uh, to do that. And part of that was actually, they actually mentioned the word wireless for these teams of care providers that can actually help with a Medicaid health home in certain states. So that's a big deal. That's a big change, you know. Not really necessarily the housing itself, but how these care teams really take care of the people, the target population. You know, again, it's changing, but it's slow. We'll get there. Last, last comment, Nigel, let me break. Just curious, has there been any evidence of health benefits by actually just getting a smartphone or a tablet? Or there, there is a lot of evidence out there. Yeah, th uh, I'll repeat the question. Has there been any evidence out there of a uh, change in health status via using a smartphone or any one of these devices? So there's a lot of evidence out there. 
um, lots of evidence, most of it funded privately, which is the problem because it's automatically discounted. Um, one of the biggest, you know, pieces of evidence that the whole industry likes to look at is the VA study, um, you know, that was done. And VA came out with some really interesting findings. I think it was like 19% um, you know, readmission, um, reduction in readmission, uh, and a number of other things. Um, you know, and I can point you to some of that stuff. So see me at by, by, by the end. But, but there is a lot of stuff out there. And, and for all of that stuff, there's always another study that says this stuff doesn't work, it's crap, blah, blah, blah. You know, you have to look at the way that they actually measure the population. You have to look at the way that they actually take in the evidence. You know, that's a very loaded question, but I like it. And, you know, see me afterwards. Great. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.